Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, many would argue that the 20th century was the most creative in recorded history. And when you look at the sheer number of innovations that have sprung from right here in the United States, it's easy to recognize why it was also called the American century. Today, our focus is on creativity and the work underway to ensure the 21st century is as creative as the last. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, we live in a state of creativity. Oklahoma is home to so many artists, performers, and even inventors to even try to name. But what about us everyday folk? So when was the last time you were truly inspired, truly excited about your life, your business, or your school? So what if, with a little creativity, you could boost your enthusiasm and your effectiveness? And even better, what if you could turn those ideas into innovations, changing our country and our world one idea at a time. From up above, it's a building like any other in downtown Oklahoma City. But inside these doors, at the Civic Center Music Hall, what you'll find is a state of creativity from those on stage. Nothing was working. To those in the audience, mostly young faces. So I'm a nuclear physicist. Not waiting on anyone or anything to create. I think a lot of people like probably falsely construe that, that physics doesn't involve a lot of creativity, uh, but it does. Taylor Wilson began working in nuclear science at age 10. By 14, he was the youngest person in history to produce a nuclear fusion. And today, at the ripe old age of 19... I, I solve problems. I take the, the physics and try to solve a problem with it. Uh, and I'm very optimistic about the future. I think that we have a lot of potential to, to, to change the world with what we're doing. And uh, so it's, it's exciting. And finding such creative solutions, author David Goldstein says, can often be found within all of us if we just know where to look. Absolutely. There's a misconception that a lot of people don't think of themselves as creative. In fact, there was a recent study that showed only one in four people think they're living up to their creative potential. But in fact, we all can be. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Here's an example. Imagine you're in a room of preschoolers and you ask, who can sing you a song? And hands go up everywhere. Ask that same question among adults, and there's often not that many takers. So as we age, do we lose our creativity or just our confidence in it? A lot of us are discouraged away from creativity at a very young age. And it's often because a teacher tells you how they're creative and they show you how they're creative, but they don't, it might not be how we're creative. So rather than encourage creativity, education can often stifle it. The first step is to know ourselves. A second step, I believe, is to go back to what you love to do as a child. All of us love to do things. Every student in my son's preschool was creative, and they were creative storytellers, actors, they built things with blocks. When kids get older, they don't see themselves as creative anymore. When adults uh, are asked if they're creative, many don't think they are. It's amazing, I interviewed so many people for the book I wrote, and I interviewed an engineer who has 20 patents, and he goes, I'm not creative, it's that guy. There are just so many ways of being creative. It's in accounting, it's in uh, sales, it's in marketing, it's in business planning. There are just so many different ways that people don't think of themselves as traditionally creative. Even in some of the harshest of conditions. On stage with Oklahoma City's mayor, Justine Mbababazi told those at this year's Creativity Forum how by looking at things differently, her home country of Rwanda grew from unspeakable tragedy. As you might know, Rwanda had a genocide in 1994 that took more than 1.5 million people in just 100 days. 
recovering from that was a dream that nobody knew that we could achieve it. It was achieved by Rwandans, ordinary citizens like myself. I am not a politician, I don't work for the government, but I'm a confident citizen who is allowed to innovate, create, and implement what I think works for my country. In her book, This Is Your Time, Rwanda, Umba Babazi tells how, rather than follow the rule of law, her country created a new path through justice, through forgiveness. So we came up with a creative ways of making sure that the perpetrator had to face a victim without a lawyer and a prosecutor involved. And that was the hardest core of serving justice in a purest sense. Because lawyers are not the victims of the crime. Perpetrators are not victims of the crime. They are all trying to be the third party, bearing the pain that is not theirs. People felt like it was a justice in innovation. Innovation that Goldstein says is in all of us in some way or another if we just look hard enough. What I think we need to do is expand the pie of people who see themselves as creative. We rely on other people to be creative. We, we, the lone inventor or the inventors in the R&D lab, but we're all creative and we all can be. And if more people in our country see themselves as creative, then we can have more output. Expanding our creativity by building bridges to our own inspiration. Now when we return, we look at how creativity can change business, education, and even government. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, in 2002, when Oklahoman Charles Nelson and his wife Candace bid farewell to their six-figure investment banking salaries to start a dessert catering business out of their kitchen, undoubtedly, some called them crazy. Today, the two are founders of the Los Angeles-based cupcake chain, Sprinkles. Using the best ingredients and baked fresh throughout the day, Sprinkles has grown from a single storefront in Beverly Hills to 12 locations nationwide and a traveling Sprinkles Mobile cupcake truck. But it was built by Pimp My Ride. With long lines of devoted fans, including many celebrities, Sprinkles has also made a celebrity out of Candace Nelson. She's a frequent guest and celebrity chef on shows around the TV dial, as well as one of the five judges on the Food Network's hit show, Cupcake Wars. And who is flying through to the next round. Success that has helped them take their brand international with 34 Sprinkles Bakeries now opening in the Middle East. A busy life that they took a break from to headline this year's Creativity Forum. So my first question is, how does someone move from investment banking to making cupcakes? Well, it doesn't seem like the most natural progression, but for me, it was natural. Baking was a passion of mine, and really it was about an obstacle that became an opportunity. Out of college, I went into investment banking and then uh, an internet startup. Well, then the dot-com bust happened, and I was without a job. And so I just really looked inward and thought, what is it that I really want to do with my life? I love to bake, and I figured, what the heck, I'll give it a try. Didn't think I could really make a living doing it, but I decided to go to pastry school and give it a shot. Charles, how important is passion to spark the inspiration that gives you the innovation? I think it really is the key, you know, one of the key drivers of success because for sprinkles, Candace and I from day one have lived, eat, and, you know, breathe sprinkles. And so when you're starting something from scratch, especially something where there's, no one's ever done it before, if you want to try to do it eight hours a day, you're not going to make it. It's about giving all you have every hour uh, that you have available. And so and it's something you're passionate about. Candace was passionate about uh, baking. I, I love dessert, so that made it easy for me. <laughs> and so it really, we're working all the time. We're talking about work all the time, but it doesn't feel like work because we love it. So how does one keep up their creativity to run a business like Sprinkles when you are working all the time? Does it go back to you have to love it? Absolutely. It becomes a lot easier if you love it because instead of feeling like you're, you know, going uphill, you're sort of rolling downhill. And, um, you know, besides that, we really try to stay open. We stay open to ideas. 
We brainstorm constantly, you know, at work, at home, and we brainstorm, you know, with our amazing employees and with our customers. We try to keep our lines of communication open through social media and in the store and at the office. Now, since the time you've started Sprinkles, we've seen the cupcake business, per se, really blossom. What has that meant for y'all? I think certainly, you know, it changes things. When we first opened, we had to explain to people, what is it? What is a cupcake bakery or why what, what is a premium cupcake and, and that question you know no longer exists in pretty much any city in america or, or for that matter a lot of in the world uh, we opened our first international store in the middle east and so there are stores everywhere now but we i think it really is about staying on top and, and that is about creativity and continuing to be creative our first idea was creative to start sprinkles and then moving on to our cupcake ATM and other things. So you have to continue to innovate and keep creativity in your business because people are going to do what you, uh, copy what you do pretty quickly. And so you can't just you know, rest your laurels on one idea. Yeah, and I have to ask, you've got to tell me more about this cupcake ATM. I mean, that could be, da <laughs> that could be dangerous, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because, as I said, we brainstorm all the time, whether it's the office or at home. And I remember being pregnant with my second son. It was maybe 11 o'clock at night, and I was just in the worst mood because I had such a hankering for a cupcake. And I thought, you know, I own cupcake bakeries, and even I can't get my hands on a cupcake at this time of night. So we just started laughing and kind of tossing these ideas, what if ideas back and forth. And in the past, these what if crazy ideas have always been good to us. So we've learned to really sort of embrace those and not just sort of say, oh, that's a crazy idea. We're not going to think about it. We thought, well, what if you could get a cupcake, you know, any time of night? And we started to think about ideas to make that happen. She says, embrace the crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's been good for you. <laughs> when, when in terms of having employees, there's, there's a certain amount of, of, of managerial things that everyone has to do whenever you have a business. How do you merge those two? I think that we have 450 employees now. We started with two, and, and it's grown quite a bit. I think... We want to make sure our employees stay creative, but we also have very high standards. And I think that is something we set our expectations from the day people start, and it's very clear what we need them to do to maintain the sprinkle standard. Uh, but we also try to keep a very flat company where people are, know that their ideas are welcomed. And we may not, you know, they may come with a cupcake flavor that we may not want to want to offer, but it, it's something that we will, you know, receive, you know, well, and we'll try it and, and give it a shot. And we do the same as Ken said from our customers. It really is open lines of communications. If you think that every great idea comes from the founder, you know, we wouldn't be very far. We have so many great ideas that come from our employees uh, and, and, our, and, our, and our customers. That's really what's made our, co our company special over the last nine years. Yeah, well, a final question. It may be that it's getting close to lunch, but... What is some of your most popular cupcakes that you sell? Well, I'll take this one because red velvet is hands down our most popular flavor. And I have to say, not growing up in Oklahoma, I didn't really have a lot of history with red velvet. And the red velvets I had, I didn't love so much. So when I was developing the menu for sprinkles, red velvet was not on the menu. And Charles said, I mean, I'm just going to be laughed all the way back home if I don't have red velvet on the cupcake menu. That is just part of growing up in Oklahoma, and you have to have that. So I thought, all right, I'll, I'll make a red velvet that I can live with. So I amped up the cocoa and made a really special butter and cream cheese frosting. And thank goodness I did, because that Ode to Oklahoma has been our number one selling flavor at every store. And if you'd like to taste what all the fuss is about, Sprinkles is now selling their cupcake mixes at over 250 Williams-Sonoma stores nationwide. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, finding creativity in government, but first, the art of education. Well, as part of the 2013 Creativity Forum, the lobby of the five-story Civic Center Music Hall took on a whole new look thanks to miles of string, strategic lighting, and some student creativity. Joining me now is our Andy Barth. Rob, students at Metro Tech put their creative skills together to design and produce an art piece that stretches five stories high. And we were there as they saw their vision come to life. From sawing to drilling. Students at Metro Tech are learning what it takes to work in the real world. I've always had a passion for art and sculpting, so this kind of is up my alley. Hassan Muhammad is a carpentry student at Metro Tech and says different classes came together to pull the project off. Sorry guys. The unique thing about it is each class has a unique task to help assemble this project. And as the carpentry class, we have to help assemble the device that's going to help manipulate the string as we string it out. 
an art piece that showcased at the 2013 Creativity Conference. But first, a string of events had to take place. The string being strung from a, a high balcony down to a low balcony, and it kind of gets more narrow as it gets to the lower balcony. You know, it kind of looks like spider webs to me, but it's supposed to appear to be a, a bridge. The theme is bridges. Where did it break from? This project includes students enrolled in computer-aided design, construction, and graphic communications. And for CAD instructor Russ Powers, working with a variety of groups is typical. That's normal operating procedure. Um, being, being in the design position, you have to think about everybody. And that's been the good thing for my students too, is for them to see that. The design is a central piece of this whole puzzle. Approximately six inches down here. And Metro Tech's Cindy Friedemann says, hands-on learning like this is influenced by the school's diversity. Our students come from various socioeconomic, societal, cultural backgrounds at Metro Tech, and we want to reach them at the point where they are able to learn. And for Friedemann, she's excited to see the various classes and students coming together. Each area touches this project at a different level and in a different way, but together the project come, comes about through the different efforts of our students. And for student Billy Jones, having his efforts displayed for Oklahomans to see is exciting. It's awesome. It makes me want to go around and tell people about it and uh, what, what class I am and how we did it, how, how long we did it and stuff like that. Bridging cultures and interests, all while creating a masterpiece. Well now the students worked with Norman artist Doug Elder who pitched the idea and let the students run with it. And from all appearances it turned out pretty good. So how long did all this take? Rob, the project like this isn't going to happen overnight and the students and the teachers put in 40 hours in the planning and designing phase and then an additional 21 hours to set the project up. And we have to understand that this project is made entirely out of many, many pieces of string and when you're maneuvering it from five stories high, string is going to break and tangle up. All right, well certainly a creative project. And Congratulations to all involved. Thank you so much, Andy. Now, if you'd like to learn more about this project and how it all came together, students at Metro Tech shot an interesting behind the scenes look, including footage shot from a little miniature drone called a UAV. Now, to see that and more, just head to our website at okhorizon.com where we have that story and others streaming under this week's value added section. So, can such creativity spread to the everyday classroom? Well, Oklahoma Secretary of Education and Workforce Development says it can and it is. So Secretary Summers, if we are to transform our educational system, if we're going to try to meet those future needs, do we start with students' passion? For the last 20 years, we've focused first on the curriculum, first on the student or the teachers, first on the schools. We got to focus first on the student. If you find a young person's passion, they will work really hard, and guess what? Hard work is how we make progress in academics. It's building a relationship, finding relevance for the kid. Rigor happens automatically. A lot of times when we're in schools, whether it be on the band or the football team or going to college or career tech, it's an either-or proposition. But you don't believe that's necessarily the way we need no, to be. No, both and thinking is hard to come by in education. All the pundits always, it's my way or the highway, everybody else is wrong. And what I've learned over the years is pragmatists, people that really succeed, think in both and. Uh, is it high level academics or career tech? It's a false dichotomy. You can actually do both. In fact, high quality career tech leads to higher quality academics and vice versa. Is it a live teacher or do we do digital content? False dichotomy. If you put both of them together, you have some of the finest personalized blend and learning we have available today. How do we introduce those people that have been successful into education? Well, you know, that's, therein lies the challenge. I, I said uh, earlier today that only in education is, f is failure accepted, success suspect, and nobody else has an idea except myself. There are great, highly successful educators in America today. Right here in Oklahoma, there are people that are getting the job done where everybody else says you can't do it. All we got to do is look around, find those folks, and learn from them. And I've heard you say we need to stop chasing the solution or quit seeking the solution. What do you mean by that? Well, 
it, in education, we're always looking for that holy grail, that one program, that one perfect approach. Uh, there were some speakers today that here is the answer. This is the kind of school. Uh, the problem is, is that students vary infinitely. And so we have to design the school around the student. Take, for example, nobody would expect the GM CEO to come out and say, we're going to find the perfect car and we're just going to build one car. It's only going to look a certain way and everybody's going to love it. That's ridiculous. And yet in education, we're going to have Read 180. We're going to have charter school. We're going to have a regular district school. We're going to have um, uh, four, four uh, various courses. Everybody's going to go do the same thing. So my formula is students times educational experiences equals results. Students vary infinitely. The educational experiences have to vary infinitely. And teachers have to have the ability to make adjustments on the fly so students succeed. Where do industry needs play into this? Well, industry and, and life generally has to define what young people need to know and be able to do, the kind of mindsets they need. Uh, it, it is no longer acceptable that everybody gets to choose what they learn on their own and then they just hope they fit into the work world. Uh, for example, high-end academics, college entrance requirements, but also career requirements. We've got to know that up front. We've got to be able to find a way to teach people what they need to know in order for them to follow their passion, find their purpose in life, be economically productive, be good citizens. Dr. Robert Summers, thank you so much. Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. Well, government is not known for its creativity. In fact, just the opposite. That's why a group called Fuse Corps is working in communities across America by enlisting the country's most entrepreneurial leaders into public service. I sat down with the group's founders, Jennifer Anastasov and Peter Sims. If you think about one of the main problems for government is that they come up with a big idea and it's maybe it's a big idea like an education or no child up and they then say to everyone else, this is what we're gonna do from the top down. As opposed to thinking about all the innovators and inventors that exist in this country who have lots of solutions to small problems that can bubble up from the bottom. And so that's one of the things that Fuse Corps is trying to do is to catalyze some of the best ideas from the country and bring it up to Washington rather than Washington coming down with edicts. We're sort of like a White House Fellows Program for mayors and governors. We pull people in who are at the very top of their fields um, and we do it for 12 months. We place them full time with mayors and governors in order to create a space for innovation. And we have a couple of twists though, right? So our, our twists are, one, they're focused on innovation. And two, our folks tend to be executives. They tend to be people who have, um, who have been entrepreneurs repeatedly. So that they actually come with a background of how do you navigate big systems or how do you work around the system to make change? So when we bring people who are from the business sector, who are entrepreneurs, and we connect them with p folks in government, there's some real positive stuff there initially because we've pulled them together and there's some disruption because there are different perspectives that are coming together. We call it the tri-sector athlete, right? You don't have to run, but your business, your, your uh, private sector and your nonprofit and you understand all of those perspectives and we're trying to create those types of folks because that's disruptive. Everyone's been in their silos for so long as we try to solve these wicked problems it's hugely difficult, and I have to imagine there's, there's some parallels in business. The only way to change something that's very rigid and, and that's been doing something a certain way for a long period of time is with small tweaks, actually. We say, okay, city or state is going along in this direction. They could be doing this thing better. There's a problem that we all agree could be addressed better. And how can people come in to government and do a series of experiments to show people that it all happens on the fringes and it's a lot of experimentation. What we're seeing is at the city and state level there is this work that's bubbling up and 
one of the things that an organization like a Fused Core can do is actually make those connections. We literally had, uh, just in March, uh, an opportunity to showcase this sort of work, whether it be uh, um, a school garden and uh, in Sacramento to uh, big changes with business and government in, in San Jose. We were able to showcase that at the White House so that folks could look there and learn from it. And other cities will copy it. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's actually what it comes to, is thinking about replication. People talk about scale all the time. Mm -hmm. Scale is good. Um, what's also amazing is when you create these sorts of small wins, these bright spots around the country, that's when people start clamoring to follow you. Everyone loves success. Everyone loves success. So you take some small, you make some small wins, you take some little bets, and people follow you. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we'll see how an Oklahoma group is changing lives around the globe by helping communities get fresh, clean drinking water for the first time. The basic challenge is just survival. We're sheltered from this. We don't remember times when one out of four, or one out of five children and family would die from a waterborne disease. Oklahoma City-based Water 4 on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, we are out of time. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week.